Children, you are dismissed for Children's Church. Good morning. I almost feel like I need to start with an apology. You've got me again. Uh, it's great to have Dr. Kowser with us last week. All struck uh, life was incredible. I wish I could give him like three weeks or get him for like three weeks. They could take that and unpack it and just, man, the depth. Uh, but I appreciate it. I thank you for being faithful. It was great turnout for the service. And uh, so now I see you all remember that I was going to be here this week. Uh, so <laughs> no, nah, I'm glad you came. We can pick back up in our series uh, we're in 1 Corinthians again, and this is, uh, this is a deeper series, as I've shared with you. I don't see a lot of people new to us. We've already been through Romans in the last few years. Uh, we've been through, and, and that would really be spiritual milk. We talked about this last time, you should crave spiritual milk. Romans would be spiritual milk. It's kind of entry-level Christianity 101. What's it mean to be a Christian? Why do we need to be a Christian? How does it look after we're a Christian? Uh, so really introductory material. And we've done the Gospel of Mark, which would be a, a little step above that, a little, little more, a little more um, depth to it. Uh, Ephesians, as I shared with you, was 102. Again, a little more advanced. But, but Corinthians really is meat and potatoes. This really is deep stuff. And so you should feel uh, encouraged by the fact that God has led us to go ahead and take these steps. It means he believes that you and, and we are mature enough to handle it. And so stay with it. It's really good stuff. Uh, the series is called For Not Of. And you're going to see a little more of explanation behind this title in today's actual message. But basically, Paul starts this church in AD 50. He, he gives them the milk of the Word of God. He, he introduces them to Christianity. Um, and, and he starts developing leadership. And they start developing churches. And he expects them to continue to mature. And so he leaves. He's like, okay, they've got the initial stuff. They're going to grow. I'm going to move on and go to another city, another place. Uh, but then a few years later, he hears they're not maturing. And that's the reason this letter was written. They weren't maturing. And because of that, the world was getting into the church. The practices, customs of the culture were being ingrained into the church. And that's not okay. And so he writes this letter to say, guys, you're supposed to be for the world, not of the world. Right? It's before the world, not of the world. You're supposed to be different, living in a world, pointing people to Jesus Christ, specifically by the way you act and by the way you live, by the way you talk, by everything that you do. It should be showing the world what it means to be a follower of Christ. And so you don't look like the world anymore. You're different. And we're going to see that specifically play out in the lesson today. Now, when I read this and I started putting together, I was, uh, was taken to northern Italy. I've had the privilege of traveling in Italy um, the southern part, really, been to Rome. I've walked the streets of Rome, uh, Vatican City. I've walked actually from the Colosseum to the Sistine Chapel and back uh, in a matter of a couple of days. It's really been a neat experience I've had to do, but I've never gotten a chance to go up north uh, to see some of the famous or maybe infamous structures. And the Leaning Tower of Pisa is one of them. Uh, the Tower of Pisa is a bell tower. It was constructed somewhere around the 12th century, and it began to tilt because it had an inadequate foundation. It wasn't strong enough to support the weight of the structure. And the tilt continued over the centuries. Okay? Um, if, if you look closely at the picture, and if you've ever seen pictures of it, it's really pretty. When you look at it, you, you see the columns, you see the arches. You can see the evidence of some very skilled craftsmen. But what really gets your attention in this building? The lean. You miss everything else because of the lean. And it leans because of a bad foundation. So you see the big picture here is the foundation draws you away from all the rest. If there's a fault in the foundation, the rest is useless. There's a fault in the foundation of many churches today. And no matter how skillful we are and how careful we are, it's not the beautiful things that draw the attention. It's the fact that the church is leaning. And we don't want that to take place. There's too much lean. And the towers. And let's be careful about this and let's look at what's God, what God's Word has to say about it. So why don't you turn with me to 1 Corinthians, our, our focal passage, chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, reading through 17. Would you stand with us, please, to honor the reading of God's Word? Uh, again, 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. Okay? This is the Word of the Lord. Because of God's grace to me, Paul writes, I have laid the foundation like an expert or master builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. 
For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we've already, already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw, or stubble. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy, and you, church, are that temple. Let's pray. Father, thank you once again for the preservation of your word. Uh, thank you for everyone who came to sit under its teaching today. Uh, Lord, there is much that we can gain from this study this morning, and so may we just put away the things that are troubling us. We all have issues and concerns in our lives. We're all dealing with different things. Uh, but while we're here, may we lay them at the foot of the cross, trusting you to work in your way according to your will. Uh, and, and let us just pay attention to what you have to say to us today. Uh, there's a lot of lean in the foundation of many churches, and so we just pray that that not be said of us. Uh, we want the world to be drawn to your beauty, uh, not to the failures. So God, pl I just pray that you'll just trust us with your word today. May your spirit move among us and change us to be more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. And if anybody's not saved, if anybody is not resting upon that, that foundation, then today will be the day that they understand their condition and the opportunity that they have before them to be saved. So God, remove me from your word, speak through it, in Jesus' precious name, amen. Please be seated. All right, if you recall in verse 9, two weeks ago, Paul made an important trans transition in his illustration. Up to this point, he's been using agriculture for an illustration. Talks about the seed, right? Paul planted the seeds of the gospel. Talks about um, those cultivating the seed or watering the seed. Right, you've got planters who plant the seed, you've got waters who come along and, and, and try to see that seed grow, but ultimately the growth belongs to God. Right? God is responsible for all growth when it comes to his seed. And so we covered that. You are his field. All right? The church, you're his field. But you're also his building. And so he shifts to an agricultural picture um, because he's going to make some more points about the building. So let's walk through his illustration today. Man, it... it this is, this is a really deep uh, study this morning, and it's a lengthy study. Uh, I wondered how we would even get through it because there's so much to gain. So stay with me on this this morning because there's a lot to talk about. Let's talk about the builders. Paul says he, he considered himself humbly an expert builder. Some of your translations say master builder. Uh, we get this word from the Greek word architectone. Does that sound familiar? You hear the word architect? That's where our, our word architect comes from, architecton in the Greek. And it meant a little more in the first century than someone who just does the design. Because an architect is the designer today. Back then, it wasn't just the designer, but the designer and the general contractor. He, he oversaw the project. He didn't just design it. And so that's what Paul is saying. He said, I was given this, this plan, and I'm overseeing this plan. And this plan is to base the foundation on Jesus Christ. And that's where we start. Paul laid the foundation of the gospel. So we are his building, right? Keep that in mind. You, he says right in the beginning in verse 9, you are God's building. If you're a Christian, you're part of God's building. And so we begin with the foundation of that building, and that has to be the foundation of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we've covered this. Paul says, when I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, Christians, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. And if you're in our Sunday night study, by the way, you'll understand he just left Athens, where he did use lofty words, where he, he did use intellectual conversation. And he comes down into Corinth now, and he has to change his approach. All right? So that's just a neat thing. That's why you should come to Sunday night. All right? He says, For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. What Paul is saying is very clear. There's a lot of neat things that we do in church. And we're going to talk about them. There's a lot of neat ideas and great positive things. But everything has to be based upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Everything. Otherwise, it will lean. And it will not be attractive to the world. Um, 
Paul's going to re- bring this back around. This is his whole point of his, this letter he writes. He says it in the beginning. He says it in the end. In chapter 15, he's going to say, Look, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. So what is the foundation? The foundation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everything we do and say has to be based on upon it. Now, I know, and, and, and I myself, as I'm reading this, I'm like, that's kind of abstract. Okay, That's an abstract thought. How do we put flesh on those bones? Let's consider this. First, you get the foundation on your handout. The foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. Okay, The foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. I could say that over and over again. It will not ever be enough. The foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. Everything we do must be based upon the foundation. So let's make this practical. Some churches are still pretty old school. And when I say old school, I mean it's behavioral. You come to church to learn how to behave, right? We want people to behave right. We want to stand against abortion. We want to stand against gay marriage. We want everybody to live in a good way, right, to to make God happy. That is a noble idea, right? But it's not a foundation. Some churches today want to get into social justice, and they're making social justice their main thing. Uh, They want to see people... Uh, reach out and help people at home and abroad who are being neglected and abused. Uh, They want to do everything they can to see that people are treated fairly. It's noble. It's not the foundation. Some churches today want to make compassion ministries uh, their main focus. They want to make sure every belly is full, there's clothes on every back, and there's roofs over every head. They want to relieve the, the burden on those suffering in poverty or other issues. It's noble, but it's not the foundation. Okay, Um, these all have merit to them, but they are flawed. They are flawed because they don't have the right foundation. We can teach people how to behave, right, and they can get the false belief that they're going to heaven because they behaved good enough. And good behaved people will spend eternity in hell. We can teach them how to behave, and all we're going to do is give them a guilt trip, because no one can live up to the standard, just as the scriptures say. Right? We cannot live up to God's glorious standard. It's not possible. So we got a lot of guilty people because we're trying to force behaviors on them. Think about the, the next one I said. We can fight prejudices and we can stand against tyrannical rulers and we can sm- win some small victories, but the actions of man cannot overturn the justice of God. And even those people who get fairly treated in this world now today because of our actions will st- still spend eternity in hell. We didn't help them. Compassion ministries, again, feed a hungry belly, Awesome. Clothe somebody who doesn't have clothes. Take up a collection of shoes and and coats and and give them to the needy. Great. You filled a temporary need and you left a permanent void. And they'll still spend eternity in hell with full full bellies and coats on their backs and your shoes on their feet. You understand this, right? These are all noble and good ideas. But they have to stem from the gospel. Why do we want people to behave well? It's not to please God. It's because based upon what Christ has done for us and how much He has given us, out of response of love, we want to live a life that honors Him. Not the other way around. We're not trying to behave to make Him happy. We're trying to live a life that honors Him because of what He's done for us. That's basing upon the foundation of the Gospel. right? We do want to see justice, right? But who is the ultimate judge? God is the judge. And He has not given us what we deserve. He has been righteous to us, more than righteous and merciful to us. And so, yes, we can reach out, but we reach out as a response to what he's already done to us. As far as compassion goes, yes, we should have the eyes of Christ. But we're not trying to reach out to people in order to earn favor with God. We're doing it because God has raised us out of our poverty. He, we know he's provided all of our needs. And because of that, we reach out and help others. There is a difference. If it's all based upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, it's a beautiful thing, the church. But when we make other things first and foremost, we are failing, and the church is leaning, and the world will see our failures instead of the beauty. Okay, So that's important to get. Everything we do must be based upon the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul moves on to say, okay, that's, that's the truth. And now, as we start to build on it, we must be careful how we build on it. Okay, We must be careful how we build on it. Notice I say we... In the pronoun usage there on that second checkpoint, we must be careful how we build on it. The Greek word there used in the second part is um, haketos. 
Hakatos. I, I don't roll my tongue very well this morning. Hakatos. Uh, it sounds like hot sauce, I know. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a Freudian thing. It, it means everyone, okay? The word means everyone builds, okay? Now, yes, that applies to Paul and to Apollos and to Peter, right? They were building upon it. But when you look down, and we're going to get to it here in a minute, when you get to verse 13, we are clearly speaking of the Bema seat, the judgment of Christ upon all believers. And you see it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, that he's speaking of all Christians. And so the context has to be broadened. We are all builders, okay? We are all builders, and we all have to be careful how we build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So let's consider the building materials that we have. Okay? Since we're all builders... We need to consider what we're building with. Paul makes a transition in verse 12. Once the foundation is laid, every member of this body, this building, has something to contribute. We're all expected to give as construction workers, basically, on this tower, this this church, uh, so that we'll draw attention to the beauty, not to the failures. That leaves a couple of questions as I was going through this. First question I had in my mind, what are we contributing, okay, specifically, and why does it matter? That's the easy one to answer. We'll get to it second. Let's start with the first. What are we contributing? What are the building materials? Short answer, our building materials are our works. Okay? Our building materials are our works. All right. If you're wondering how we know that, you can look back at verse 13. Paul speaks of the kind of work each builder has done. ESV says each one's work. Okay? So we're talking about our works. I think John MacArthur explained it well in his commentary on this passage. He said the, material, uh, the materials represent believers' responses to what they have, how well they serve the Lord, and what He has given them. In other words, they represent our works. So our building materials are our works, and the first checkpoint there is our works are expected. Okay, They are expected. In other words, everyone who is a part of this building, everyone who's in the family of God, is expected to work. Of course, we have to remember our works do not save us. We're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. And so we can't boast about it. But as I mentioned already, we work because we are saved. And we find that in the book of James, one of the toughest books of the Bible, but one of the most important, I believe, in points like this. James 2, 14 through 18. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Unless it produces good deeds or works, Faith is dead and useless. I'll show you my faith how? By my good works, by my deeds. And so first and foremost, do you have any building materials at all? Do you have anything to contribute to this building? If not, this is a day for a salvation check. A lot of professing believers are good at going to church. They'll come and sing the songs. They'll give God an hour a week. But there's absolutely no construction going on. They're giving nothing, right, except an hour a week. And that's not okay, right? That's not okay. We are all part of the contrib- contribution to this building. And so if you're not making contributions, this is a good day to step back and say, God, why, why am I not? All right, why am I not? What's wrong? Is there something wrong with my foundation? Does my foundation need work? In other words, am I actually saved? Okay, because if you are saved, you'll be contributing. Okay, so our works are expected. What are those works? First, I'm going to be practical. Again, borrowing some from my commentaries. Uh, our conduct is a part of our work. And so I told you, we're going to talk about being for the world, not of the world. Here's the real sticky stuff. The way we conduct ourselves should show that we're for the world, not of the world. We're different. All right? Once we're saved, we have the foundation laid upon our hearts of Jesus Christ, and we are to conduct ourselves completely differently than we used to. As I mentioned earlier, again, we're not trying to behave to make God happy. We're behaving out of gratitude of what God has done for us. I'll give you a few examples, okay? If we're going to be for the world, not of the world, if we're going to be contributing um, the precious metals instead of the wood, hay, stubble, this is what it looks like. Instead of hoarding our resources and spending them all on ourselves, we're generous. That's being for the world, not of the world. Instead of being lazy and trying to get by with doing as little as possible, we're going to work hard at everything we do. That's being for the world, not of the world. Instead of cursing and swearing, gossiping and slandering, we control our tongues if we're going to be for the world, not of the world. Instead of lying, we tell the truth. Instead of lashing out in our anger, we control ourselves. 
Instead of accusing and insulting, we only speak things that are good and encouraging. Instead of being prejudiced, we see everyone as equal in the eyes of God. Instead of rebelling against authority, we submit to our authorities as unto the Lord. Instead of being sexually immoral, we strive for sexual purity. The list goes on and on and on. Our conduct is our building material. Remember, we're supposed to be for the world, not of the world. We're supposed to be different. And so the way we conduct ourselves is the beauty of the structure. Okay, that's, that's what the world needs to see. The second part, the second building material we have is our service. Okay, it's our service. Obviously, our conduct is, is part of the building material, but so is our service. Paul's going to address this later, and we're going to get into the gifts of the church and, and specific things that you're gifted to do. And so I'll keep it general in this study, and, and there's enough to talk about here. We all are given three resources, and Pastor Mark talks about this when he does his series. Time, talent, treasure. Time, talent, treasure. Those are God's gifts to us. We all have an X amount of time. We all have an X amount of talent and X amount of treasure. Some it's differently distributed. Some have a lot of time, but not as much talent and treasure. Some have a lot of talent, not as much time and treasure. Some have a lot of treasure, not as much time and talent. Say that really fast three times. And I was rehearsing this morning. I was like, wow, let's, let's not trip over that one. Um, they're given in diff- different distributions to each of us, but the same expectation that we will use our time, talent, treasure to serve the Lord once we're saved. Okay, so, so let me get your, give you a window. Be less abstract. Here's, here's just some questions okay, that came to my mind this week. If you're a talented teacher, why would you only use that talent to make money in the schools and not use it in the church? Good question, right? Because this is the service place. If you're a talented leader, and we have a lot of talented community leaders and, and, and uh, people in the secular world that are leaders, if you're a talented leader, why only use it in the workplace and not use it in the church? All right? If you have, and I'll go to the other end of the spectrum, if you've got a lot of spare time on your hands, why use it seeking entertainment with your nose and a TV or a cell phone or an iPad? And why not use it serving someone else? You see the picture. We all have resources. All of us have resources. And we're supposed to use them to serve the Lord. Those are our building materials. That's what makes the building attractive to the world if we're based upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. So our service should make us attractive. So we kind of answered the question, what are we contributing? Our conduct and our service. Pretty straightforward. Makes it simple. Now why? This is the hard part. Our works will be judged. Our works will be judged. It matters because we are going to stand before a judge. Now, if you have no works, this is an important evaluation to make because there are two judgments. All right, two judgments. Paul is speaking of a future judgment in this verse, verse 13. There are two judgments. There's the great white throne judgment given in Romans chapter, or Revelation chapter 20. Excuse me. Revelation 20 speaks of a time at the end of known time where the dead who have not accepted Christ, everyone who is unsaved, has died and gone into the grave, will be resurrected. Nobody just dies and ceases to exist. Those who reject the gospel, who who say, I don't need it, it's not for me, you guys can keep it, it's a crutch, Um, I'm all right on my own, and die that way, will be resurrected. Yay! No! be resurrected to stand in front of Jesus Christ who will open up the books, the text says. And basically, he's going to go down and and go through every sin they ever committed in their life, whether they live seven years, 70 years, 700 years as in the Old Testament. Every sin they ever committed is going to be brought back up. Then a guilty verdict is going to be given. There's not going to be any arguments or excuses. There'll be a guilty verdict and there'll be immediate judgment. It's eternity in the Gehenna hell, lake of fire, with Satan, the false prophet, and the beast. Boom. That's the judgment of the unsaved. So if there is no building material in your life, you need to evaluate this because we may not be talking about the same judgment. All right? That's the judgment of the unsaved. Did you realize as a Christian you'll be judged too? A lot of Christians think, I escaped the judgment. I'm going to heaven. This is awesome. Yay, God. No, you didn't escape the judgment. You get judged for something different. You don't get judged for your sin. Jesus Christ covered those when you accepted his forgiveness. It's as far as the east is from the west, right? They never touch. The consequences of the ultimate consequences of my sin will never touch me. I will go to heaven. 
because I've trusted in Jesus Christ. That's awesome. But what I've done since that day, when I knelt at that little steel chair in that room on the upstairs at Kings River, which was the first assembly of God, since that day, everything I have contributed to the foundation, I will be judged for. Everything that I've done as a Christian, all of my works, I will be judged for. And so will you. And that's a powerful thought. So every believer is going to be judged, and you stop and think about it. There's going to be a, a, a determination of value to what you've done. It's either going to fall in that category of gold, silver, and jewels, which are considered precious. The fire won't destroy them. Or it's going to be wood, hay, and straw, which are going to be burnt up. And so you're standing there with all of the things that you've done in your hands, and fire is going to test it. And it's going to reveal one of two things. One, that it has value, or another, that it had no value. Let me give you some practical illustrations. Some things that I thought of. Let's say you get a big tax return this spring, unlike some of us. Uh, and you're, you're going to be generous. You're going to give half of it to your local church. That is awesome, okay? That's above and beyond. That's great. So you're going to do that. And so you write this great big check. You don't fold it. You make sure your name is readable on it. You put the letters in big, big letters, and you lay it in the offering plate face up. Or you use an offering envelope, and they do have a place for your name and a place for the amount. So you write that big amount there, and you big D A V. Can you read that on the back of the room? And you lay that face up in the offering plate so that the next six or seven people that it goes by can see wood, hay, straw. You get it? You did a work. And the Lord's going to bless the church by it, but you're not going to get a reward for it. Let's say you put it face down. You see the difference it makes? Who's it glorifying? We'll talk about that. Let me give you another example. Let's say you're a talented musician or singer, and you come and you sing and you play in church in hopes that somebody will pat you on the back or reach around and say, man, you got a beautiful voice. Or you just, you just have a wonderful talent of what you do. And you like it. Wood, hay, stubble. God will still use it for His glory. But when you stand before Him with this, it's going to burn up. But let's just say when you sing or when you worship with an instrument, people recognize Jesus and not you. Gold, silver. Precious Jim says that makes sense. I, I could go through illustration after illustration. Here's what it boils down to. Our motives for working determine our value of the work. So our motives for de working determine the value of our work. Why we do what we do is what matters. Are we doing it to point others to Jesus Christ? Are we doing it for the furtherance of the kingdom? Are we doing it because we're building on the right foundation? Or do we have other motives? If we have other motives, that tower is leaning way too much. And it's drawing people to us and not Jesus Christ. And those will be burn up. We get no reward for that. Right? We're rewarded for the times that we're pointing Jesus, people to Jesus. Okay, So that's important, and I will throw in the caveat. It's important to understand. This is the judgment of believers. That's why he adds that portion. You'll be snatched just as if someone out of the fire. This is not an argument for purgatory in the Catholic faith. Some use it incorrectly, and it's not okay. This is not purgatory. This is the judgment of every believer that happens later. It's not happening after you die. It happens later when Christ returns. So don't get this wrong. This is the judgment of the works of the believers. And every one of us will stand before him with our hands full, and many will leave with their hands empty. And that's not okay. So in the last two verses, let me bring this around. Let me land the plane. Uh, Paul brings it back to the illustration. He starts off, you are his building, and it brings it back and says, you are his specific building, his temple. So we are the temple. This building is not holy. Okay, some people will hold a church building as, as sanctified or precious. It's not holy. You are. You, the collection, the, the group of believers that are gathered here is what makes this place holy and righteous. You and I are the body, the building of Jesus Christ. Now, the foundation is not our responsibility. That's God's. Remember, somebody plants the seed, somebody waters the seed, God makes it grow. So God's responsibility is the foundation. 
Our responsibility is building upon that foundation. We're all expected to with our conduct and our service. It's that simple. So to go back to that opening illustration, due to the faulty foundation of the, the Tower of Pisa, um, it continued to lean over the centuries, and in 1990, they shut it down. It got so unstable, they were afraid. As you climbed up, it, it was going to fall, and people were going to get killed. And so they actually shut it down because the foundation was so bad that it was becoming devastating. And so they worked on it, and they worked on it. They removed some of the heavier stuff, some of the stuff that it didn't need. Well, we could go into that for a while. And then they worked on the foundation. And they did enough foundation to get it stable again to open it back up. We need to do foundation work today. That's why we came to church. Let's all look and make sure our foundations are solid. They're right. Let's make sure our tower is not leaning. Let's make sure we are conducting ourselves. We are serving in a way that brings glory and honor to the foundation of the church, Jesus Christ. So what do we need today? God's word demands a response, does it not? Some of us may need to check our foundation. Maybe we can't put our finger on any kind of works or any kind of contribution that we make. We are either disobedient or unsaved. We've got to look at that right now and figure, because we talk, there is a judgment. If you stop breathing today and you don't have that figured out, you're not based upon the right foundation, you will stand before a judge. And he will not give you any mercy at that point. Mercy is available today. So I encourage you this morning, if, if you are not a Christian, you're not here by accident, God has drawn you to his side again to share the foundational truths that yes, you're a sinner, but God loves you anyway. Out of his great love, he sent Jesus Christ to die to pay for our sins so that we could be forgiven, and he raised him on the third day to, show, day to show us that we could have eternal life. If that is real to you today, you are ready to surrender your life to following him. I don't know what else it will take, but I encourage you to get your foundation squared away this morning by coming to the front during our invitation and just saying, hey, I'm unsaved, but I want to be right today. For the rest of us, this is a not-so-subtle reminder. What we do with our lives matters. Everything we do with our lives matters. And so let's step back and say, is it hay, wood, straw? Or is it gold, silver, and precious stones? God gives us the opportunity today to make a difference, to change that. So maybe today is the day to make a commitment to conducting ourselves as though we are grateful of what's happened to us. Maybe it's the day we commit ourselves to serving out of gratitude for the way that he served us. Whatever it is, let's get our building material squared away. Now, every Lord's Day is a special day. It's not the Sabbath. Sabbath is Friday night to Saturday night. The Lord's Day is the first day of the week, and we were commanded to meet in this day. And everyone's special, but some are even more. And today is one of those days. As God's church is his building, we are commanded to observe communion. That's what's in front of me. We observe to, commute, to observe the foundation of the church, and that's what this table represents. It was his body that was broken for us. It was his blood that was shed for us. That's what the foundation of the church is built upon. And so every so often we gather together to be reminded of that. And so those of us who are Christians this morning, we are going to use this time of invitation, maybe to come and pray, because we need to talk to God about our conduct and our service. Maybe it's a relationship, whatever it is. We're going to use this time, and we're going to seek God's face, and we're going to ask for his forgiveness of our sins so that we can take communion in the right way. Those of you who aren't Christians, just pass the plate. There'll be other Christians who, Christians who will do that too. No one will frown on you, okay, at all. But I'd still prefer that you came forward before we did it. God would still prefer that you came forward before we did it and got your life right and took communion for the first time for real. And so today could be the day of your salvation. I'm going to pray. I'm going to sit down. Dale's going to sing a song for us. This is our song of contemplation. If you need to come and respond, do so. Let us know if you'd like our help. Otherwise, right where you are, prepare your hearts for communion. Father, thank you for what we're about to do and what we've already done. Thank you for the clarity of your word through your spirit. Thank you for the, uh, the pain that it brings in our lives because we're still living and breathing. There is more for us to do and what we do from this point on matters 
And so may we make sure that it matters for your kingdom, that we're building upon the right foundation. And so God, thank you for that. Thank you for the opportunity of salvation again for those who are here who aren't Christians. Uh, Father, I just pray that this will be the compelling time, the time they realize that they don't need to face that judgment we discussed. Instead, they can build their lives upon the right foundation and start moving forward. Give them the strength to come forward during this time of invitation. In Jesus' precious name, amen. This is your opportunity.